And in tonight's lesson, we're going to go into an area which you don't always hear about in church very much. You don't hear preachers talk about it. And of course, I'm not a, a, a mental health counselor. I'm not a psychologist by any stretch of the imagination. But as we run through the Word of God, you're going to notice there's quite a bit in the Word of God speaking toward mental health. Whether it be Moses as he is waiting among his people, begging God to go ahead and take him because it appears or feels like he is so alone. Whether it's over in 1 Kings chapter 19 where Elijah once again cries out to God as he deals with the deaths of depression that he feels. Feeling like all the things that he's done, all the dreams that he's had, all the work which he's tried to accomplish have all been for naught. And as you run through scripture so often, over and over and over, you see that our bodies are interconnected. There's the physical, there's the mental, there's the spiritual, and there's the psychological. And each one of these different aspects affect the other. And it's hard when you're struggling physically to be well in the other three. It's hard when you're struggling spiritually to be well in the other three. It's hard when you're struggling mentally. And it's hard when you're struggling psychologically to be well in the other three. Jesus says in John chapter 10 and verse 10, the end of that verse, I have come that you may have life and that you may live it more abundantly. That word life is specific. We talked about this in my Sunday morning class. There's two, multiple Greek words, but two specific Greek words which oftentimes come up in the Bible. Speaking of life, the first word is the word bios, B-I-O-S. And that is life as in you are alive. You got a pulse, you're breathing, you are moving through life. And if you're here tonight, you're alive, right? You've got the bios going. The life which Jesus promises us is not the bios, it's a zoe, Z-O-E. And what that is, is a fulfilled life. A life in which you are really living. A life where you have hope. A life where you have purpose. A life where you do more than exist. Jesus came that you might have eternal life. But he also came that in this life, you may know your reason. You may have joy. You may truly have peace. And so, as we compare what our Bibles teach us about life, about mental health, we compare it to what's happening in our culture. As we look around at the issues of our society, take, for instance, many of the school shootings. What you see so often among these people, they're usually Caucasian, usually male, usually have a troubled life at home. You see that they do not have spiritually what Jesus has promised. They don't see purpose. They don't see hope. They don't see what God has put us here on this earth for. You look at crime in the inner cities and even in rural areas such as this. Oftentimes, those who perpetuate such things, there's background stuff, there's drugs, there's broken families and such. But many times it's because people don't know Jesus. They don't have Zoe. A full life, a full purpose, and a full reason. Now, over the last few weeks, we've been going slowly through the book of Proverbs and seeing what God says to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about many of the serious issues of life that you and I face. Many of the serious things that we go through. And so tonight, we're going to study what the book of Proverbs tells us in wisdom about mental health. Now, first of all, we're going to look at the priority of our inner life. The priority that is there. And so, you see Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 14. A man's spirit sustains him in sickness, but a, notice this passage, crushed spirit who can bear. 
A crushed spirit who can bear. So often we think, man, happiness, joy, life, it depends on outward circumstances. And as I mentioned before, many times when we're looking at the health crises that our nation is facing, we look at the externals. Oh, there's the broken home. Oh, there is the drug addiction which is there. Oh, there is a person who feels lost in this and that and whatever else. But you know, happiness doesn't depend on external circumstances. Some of the greatest people of our society have risen from terrible homes. Some of the people that we know who have accomplished the greatest things are not defined by their past. They're defined by what's truly inside of them. Defined by truly what's most important. Something I found interesting, I, I found it as I was studying for this lesson. A uh, commentator many years ago wrote this. He was talking about Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. And what that commentator says is, I want you to notice the prayers of Paul. Paul's in prison writing to churches, which many of the people in those churches are very likely to go to prison as well. If you are in dire circumstances and you are writing to people who are in dire circumstances, what would you include in your prayer? Let me tell you what I include in my prayer. When I pray to God, I pray for health. I pray for the protection of my children. I pray that, you know, temptations and troubles won't be there. I pray for very physical things, not just for me, but even more so for my family and people whom I love. Sometime as you're going through your daily Bible reading, notice the prayers of Paul. There are times where he prays about the chains that he's in. There are times where he has prayed specifically to God, 2 Corinthians 12, about the thorn in his flesh. But many times as he is praying, he's praying about their inner spirit. He's praying about things that he truly considers important. Their mental health, which is there, and more so their spiritual health, which exists. And he recognizes very much so what we see here in Proverbs 18, 14. That a spirit can sustain you in times of sickness, but a broken spirit will bring everything else down. You can be racked with terrible disease, but if you're right mentally, spiritually, you can endure and be faithful through those times. If you're broken, even a healthy body is going to go down. If you're broken, even a healthy relationship is going to struggle. If you're broken, it's only a matter of time till absolutely everything else is broken. Solomon speaks of this, the writer here of Proverbs 18... In the very next, next book, Ecclesiastes. And he speaks of how he's received great wealth. He speaks of how he's received great blessings, relationships, monuments that he's built. Wonderful things. And he says, you know, at the end of it, it's all vanity. Really, this stuff doesn't matter. It doesn't bring fulfillment. It doesn't bring joy. And as he looks through, looking for the meaning of life, where does he end? You know how it goes. Chapter 12, 13, and 14. Here, therefore, this is the end of the commandment. Follow God, he says. Put him first. Do it when you're young, when it's easier. Finding God, finding your spirit, and having a good spirit is what keeps you through everything that you face. When you reach the end, the bank account doesn't matter as much. The physical blessings don't matter as much. The physical health doesn't matter as much. A broken spirit breaks down the body. But those who are whole in Christ, they're the ones who find zoe, life, joy, which is there. And that's why Jesus has come. Now, let's look at our next slide, the complexity of our inner spirit, which is here. And we're going to look at four ways. Maybe five, but I couldn't figure out a way to put number five in there. And it makes the sermon shorter. Complexity. How do you not have a crushed spirit? Well, crushed spirits sometimes have a physical reason. Proverbs 14 and verse 30, passion makes the bones rot. 
That word for passion means uh, heat, an anger that is inside, a, uh, a rush of adrenaline, we might say. And how many people do we know, maybe even ourselves, who are so worked up about issues and anger that it keeps us up at night? That perhaps it leads to ulcers and digestive issues? Perhaps it leads to headaches? And we're so filled with passion and what's going on in our hearts and our lives that physically, in some ways, we break down. And we're not what we want to be. We're not what God has designed us to be. We're not experiencing that peace that passes all understanding. Philippians chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. Passion. Outward things sometimes can make our bones rot and make us not be what we need to be. You and I, we have to learn how to resolve issues when people wrong us. Whether it's Matthew 18, whether it's learning to walk away from the conflict. You and I at times have to learn how to soothe ourselves and how to take care of ourselves because God commands that we love ourselves. That we keep ourselves as a holy temple unto God. We can't burn with that passion, with that anger, that hot feeling, and that bitterness that's there. Our emotional health controls our physical health in many ways. Secondly, our crushed spirit can have an emotional reason. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 25, an anxious heart weighs a man down. There's a necessity in life. God said in the very beginning of the book of Genesis, it's not good for man to be alone. Now sometimes we read that and think, well, that means that it's dangerous for me to be single. God wants me to get married. Not anymore. Not necessarily. But God does intend for you to have a fellowship. God intends for you to be around like-minded people. God intends for you to be someone who helps other people and to be around people who will help you to be better. I joke sometimes about how we end up being like the people whom we are around. People in Louisiana and Boston, they have those cute little accents, don't they? You can tell immediately exactly where they're from. And then you and I visit Chicago or visit some other place, and they're like, where in the world have you come from? I don't speak with an accent until I listen to myself as I'm preaching. And then I think, how in the world did I learn to talk that way? No one of us have ever grown up saying, I want an accent. We do it because the people we're around. And the people that you're around... Shape the way that you speak. The people that you're around shape the way in which you eat. The people you're around shape the way that you treat other folks. The people you're around shape the way that you vote politically. The people that you're around shape who you are spiritually. That's why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Beware of evil companionship. Because it will change who you are. When you and I look at ourselves emotionally, companionly, if that's a word, what do the people that we're around cause us to be? How do the people that we're around shape our thinking? Now, I have reached the age where I look at the young people and tell them, beware of what you see on TikTok. And they look right back and they say, beware what you see on Facebook. And we look back and forth and we realize that what we see online, what we see in television, what we listen to in podcasts, what we listen to in music shapes who we are. And it shapes how we think. And many people have a crushed spirit because we fill ourselves up with garbage. We fill ourselves up with the issues and the problems of life. And then we're shocked. We're shocked that we have a broken spirit. A crushed spirit sometimes will have a moral reason. Proverbs 28.1, that's a quote of Leviticus 
26 and verse 7. And that says, an evil man flees even when no one is chasing after him. That's interesting, isn't it? For that to be quoted four times in the Old Testament, that's an interesting statement. What's it talking about? You have a conscience. Especially if you grew up in church. Especially if you grew up around spiritual people experiencing spiritual teaching. And there are many people who, when we look at our lives, see the brokenness which is there. And we see the shortcomings which exist in our life. And we do truly see Romans 3, 23, that all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And we see that first part of Romans 6, 23 that says the wages of sin is death. And as you and I dwell on our shortcomings, we flee. There are some times where people don't even know of our sin... And yet we spend our time trying to compensate, trying to pay back, trying to make things right, even though no one sees it. And it fills up our hearts with bitterness. It fills up our hearts with concern and problems. But notice Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. That's the part we like to quote. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Keep reading verse 17, For Jesus did not come to this world to condemn it. No, He came that He might redeem, that He might save the world as a gift unto Himself. Tonight, when you look at yourself spiritually, are you a person who is running away even if no one's chasing? Are you a person that's burdened down because of your sin and because of your shortcoming? Is your spirit crushed because you see that you can't make it on your own? Jesus has come that you might have life and that you may have it more abundantly. There's an existential aspect to this, and that's one that's not up there. It's hard to spell existential. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 30. Even in laughter, the heart can be sad. Even in times of joy, we find grief. This is one of those passages that you don't understand until you get some age on yourself. Life, when you begin it, is so enjoyable. But as time goes on, experiences happen, people move away. People die. People leave. And the longer you live, the more lonely it becomes. There are many people tonight who, looking at their family, they can say, you know, I'm the last one left. Of my family. Everybody else has gone on to see the Lord. There's many times where we may come back to a school reunion or come back to a certain festival and we look around and the people who we love and the people who we're with, they're not there. And it's an existential crisis because as we go along, we realize those who live upon this earth oftentimes will struggle. And oftentimes we'll suffer. And it causes our soul to be crushed. It makes heaven much sweeter. And it makes the promise of eternity to be much greater. Many times I used to say, man, I can't wait to get to heaven. And ask those people, why in the world did you eat that fruit? Ask Noah, why didn't you slap that mosquito? That would have helped a lot of stuff right there, wouldn't it? To ask David, why couldn't you go to war instead of looking and finding Bathsheba? To ask different apostles this question and to ask Jesus this question. And I do look forward to doing a lot of those things. I got a lot of good questions to ask a lot of people. But I look forward to going to heaven to see those whom I'm known here on this earth. To being with my friends and my family once again to being among those who have stood for their faith, who have passed down their faith to me and to others, and to share those good times which are there. 
Our soul is crushed if you live only for this world and think this world is all that there is. But abundant life is found when you truly believe the promise of Jesus that where I'm going, I shall bring you with me and that he will never leave us nor forsake us. A crushed spirit has a faith aspect. Proverbs 15, 30, heartache crushes the spirit. When you look at your life and you ask yourself what truly, truly is most important, what is your answer? Is it what other people think about you? Is it the possessions that you have? Is it the health and vitality that you feel? Whatever it is, if it's physically upon this earth, it's passing. There's one thing that remains and shall remain forever. It's the Word of God. It's our spiritual nature, which has an eternal nature, if you look at it through the present into the future, where the soul will never die. We have to have that feeling, that idea of faith in God. Now let's look at the solitude. That'll be our next slide. The solitude of a crushed spirit of the inner life. Proverbs 14.10, every heart knows its own bitterness, and no one else can share its joy. Every heart knows its own bitterness. Do you know you can live with someone, eat with someone, spend your life with someone, and there are some cases where you never truly know everything about that person? Did you know that even though you have parents who watch you like a hawk, they're those hovering parents, they can't read your every thought, sometimes thankfully. Did you know as you go through life, there is one person who experiences what you experience and understands what you're going through, and that one person is you. Now, yes, God can read your mind. Yes, Jesus knows your heart. But in many ways, there's a solitude in life which we experience. And when we place our trust, our self-worth, our feelings of importance on other people, you have to realize, first of all, they're not infallible. People will many times let you down. Secondly, you have to understand they don't know everything about you. But God does. God knows everything about you. Don't expect other people to provide your happiness, your hope. Don't expect other people to know everything which is going on in your life. Closely related to that, Proverbs 16 and verse 2, it's the Lord who knows the mind of man. It's the Lord who truly knows exactly who you are. You remember that song, that church song, there's an all-seeing eye watching you? That song used to creep me out, i got to confess. You're not leaving that tonight, right? No, all right. There's an all-seeing eye watching you. You know, it's kind of scary. God sees everything about you. And in a sense, yes, that may make you uncomfortable. But in another way, in the way the song was written, it's a way of comfort. God knows you when you're filled with anxiety. God sees you when you're filled with sorrow. God is still there for you when you mess up. God is there for you when you feel like you should lose hope. There's an all-seeing eye watching you. And as Proverbs 13 says, He Himself has said, I will never forsake you nor leave you. The writer of Proverbs says, Well, then what for shall I fear? For what can man do unto me? The most important relationship you will ever have, the most important decision you will ever make, is a personal decision. Your parents cannot make it for you. Your spouse, your children cannot make it for you. Your friends can encourage you, but they cannot make it for you. It's a personal relationship that you have with the Lord. The decision that you will make to live by faith. 
to obey, not just outwardly, but to give your heart fully and absolutely to God. There's a solitude which is there. But we must be faithful to the God's plan of salvation. Even we ourselves will not always fully understand us. But God understands you. God knows you. God loves you. Lastly, we come to the healing. The healing of a crushed spirit. C.S. Lewis, a Christian author from many many years ago, wrote, Most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want, and want acutely, something that cannot be obtained within this world. It's been said there's a hole in our heart in the shape of a cross. And there's nothing else which can fill it except Jesus. Jesus. Sometimes we sprinkle friends in there. Sometimes we sprinkle self-importance in there. Sometimes we try to put our friend, whatever it is that we have. Nothing can bring about Zoe. Nothing can bring about fulfillment but Jesus Christ. You ever think about the ark that you read of in the Bible? I'm not talking about Noah's ark. I'm talking about the narrative all the way through. Before the very foundation of this earth, God already had the church in his mind. He knew what was going to happen. He knew how it was going to go. And he already had the solution ahead of time. And so when God created me and God created you, he knew that you would have one need, one need primarily. And that was Jesus on the cross. And so while it broke God's heart to send Jesus to this earth, while it broke God's heart to see him beaten and tortured by the Romans and by the Jews, and while it hurt him so badly, <coughs> as Jesus on that cross said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God put Jesus on that cross so that you could stand in his place. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, I think. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we, through the righteousness of God, may be made holy, righteous in him. Starting at the very beginning of the world, looking all the way here, we're in 2022, God has worked this world in its way, Acts 17, Galatians 4, 4, to bring you to salvation, to give you life, to heal that broken spirit.